Divine Truth. The name of this presentation is True Spirituality and is part of the Human Soul series. It was presented in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia on the 10th of June 2012. This is part one. Getting a view of that. Okay, and um, well, what we've decided we'll do today is we'd like to involve you a little more today in the discussion, but uh, we'd also like to present a lot of the information we still wanted to present. So, so we're going to have a, Mary's sort of going to guide the discussion to a degree. I'm going to be the scribe who scribes your comments up on the board, and uh, and we'll talk about the subject. And so, the subject, as a reminder today is about how do we know what is true spirituality. And uh, so what we would like to do, remember yesterday we discussed pseudo-spirituality and the qualities of pseudo-spirituality. So today what we want to do is discuss the qualities of true spirituality. How can we see what real spirituality is in comparison to pseudo-spirituality. So we'd like to get started pretty much like we did yesterday. Myself and Mary will start. And well, I'd love to hear from you guys what you came up with because you might already cover our list. <laughs> so uh, remember yesterday we went through a, a list of different things that pseudo-spirituality... Um, the, the hallmarks the of hallmarks or the, the signs or attributes of pseudo-spirituality. So what we'd like to do is contrast that with true spirituality today. So, so does anyone have any ideas? What, what is a hallmark of true spirituality, Alex? Um, I just felt basically, um, very simply, it's living in the soul as opposed to um, a lot of the things that we mentioned yesterday were um, uh, living in the mind, living in the body, um, the, the spirit body. Avoiding the true self was a big theme yeah. we talked about a lot. Yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah, yeah. To, yeah, to kind of cram it into one little box is like living in the soul. Yeah. Yes. That involves a lot of things, I guess. But. So let, let's look at what it specifically involves, though. Can you remember yesterday we said that one of the hallmarks of pseudo-spirituality is it's very complicated, um, has a lot of complex principles. Uh, so what, what, what do you feel a mark of true spirituality would be? Simplicity, yeah. So, so let's look at that one. That's <coughs> number one, simple. And e easy to understand. Yes. Something um, we mentioned yesterday was that, um, that a child should be able to understand, this, understand this relationship we can have with God or how to grow spiritually. Yeah. Yeah. So that's fairly obvious, isn't it, that one? And perhaps if Mary yeah. lists the so the, the second one we had that we was that yesterday. it's illogical and makes little sense is the, the uh, one of the hallmarks of pseudo spirituality. So what would so be real spirituality or true spirituality? If uh, logical. logical, so so it's got to be logical. And my my pen is going to run out. I can tell that's happening already. Okay, I'll just get you. So here. logical. There's one here. Makes sense. <laughs> Sense all the time. So, as uh, as you would expect, true spirituality you should be able to build on top of it, but it still the foundation still makes sense even after you build on top of it. So as you keep building, keep building, keep building, everything still makes sense. Everything's still quite logical and makes sense. If, it, if it's not logical, then we've got to start questioning whether, it's, whether it, it means anything or not, really. Because uh, God gave us a brain and, and logic so that we could reason on matters. And it makes sense that uh, God wants us to use our brain to a degree to reason on things to work out whether things are logical or not logical. And, uh, and so it makes sense that true spirituality would be logical. It would, all, it would all make sense. And in fact, this is one of the things I find that a lot of men have with spirituality. A lot of the so-called New Age spirituality, men do not find very attractive. 
And one of the main reasons why is because a lot of it doesn't have much logic. And that's why a lot of men feel a bit turned off to it all. You know, it goes into the mysticism, the uh, angels, the, you know, all those other things that seem to appeal to the emotion. But it doesn't go into much logic, scientific sense. And that's where, that's, that's where it's, uh, it's very important to understand that true, the truth will always go into scientific, logical sense as well. It's going to be a mixture of both, in fact. Okay, well, okay. that leads to the third point we had, which was pseudo-spirituality is often mystical, mysterious, flaky and irrelevant. So what's the opposite? Practical, yeah. And we can relate it to day-to-day -day living. So it's we grounded. can relate to yep. it, yeah. Yep. What else is the opposite to mystical? Realistic. Realistic. Um, transparent, yes, we could use that as a term. Yeah. Any other ideas you'd come up with there? It's fair. Based on evidence, yes? So. Yes, so let's make it scientific evidence. The evidence that we can at some point go through some kind of experiment and actually validate that it's true. Yes? So um, true, the mark of true spirituality is it would allow science to actually confront it. And science would actually support it in the long run. Whereas uh, a, good, a good sign of pseudo-spirituality is the more scientific investigation you put into it, the more it seems that it's not true. <laughs> yeah. With uh, true spirituality, the more scientific uh, investigation you put into it, the more we expose the truth of it. Um, and so we discover more and more truth in that process. Yep. And that makes sense too, doesn't it? If God's the great scientist of the universe, it would make sense that the more we investigate science, the more we would also discover about God and the more we would discover about God's truths. So there's, log there's a logical sense in that. The okay, the next one we talked about was that um, pseudo-spirituality is often fake and promotes and loves the facade. So what would true spirituality do? Matt? Uh, just if we, Mike. Sure, sorry. Um, it would promote genuine change in the soul. So, yeah, so there have to be some genuine, sincere change. Not, not flaky. Yeah. If you could uh, use the mic, because otherwise we don't hear it. Allow you to be true to yourself. Yes, but the problem sometimes with being true to yourself is that you can be true to yourself and still be in a lot of error. So, so it would have to have a combination of things there, wouldn't it? Have to be, you'd have to be able to be true to your, uh, to your feelings, even if you know your feelings are in error. Yes. Yeah. Have you got the mic with you? <laughs> When you say yes, but you can say it in the mic. <laughs> All right. I don't know if it fits here, but inclusive in that you feel that if you do have error, it's almost like you're allowed to have You're error. allowed to make mistakes, yes. Yep. yep. Allows mistakes. So, and also the absence of judgment is really what you're saying as well, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And yeah. I don't know if that comes under love or... Yeah, well, it will come under some other headings. But if we look at this uh, allowing of mistakes... Um, if we're really focused on finding out the truth, at some point we're going to make a mistake, aren't we? We're going to have to experiment to, with a lot of different things that might be in error to, before we actually find the truth. So, so the, the beauty of true spirituality is that it doesn't force people to believe things without there being evidence, and it also allows people to make mistakes before they find out the truth. So, so they're not, they're not uh, having to be forced into accepting something without there being evidence to support that particular thing. Yeah. And, and I sort of mean by um, being accepting who you are now, as in yes. not being in the facade. So I don't know how to describe that. Um, yeah, so it, 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 I feel that's a part of, part being, of being genuine, genuine really. Yeah. Like, okay. you know, if, if you truly accept who you are right now, then you will always... You will always go through this process of letting yourself be yourself, even if others around you 
seem like they want to judge you and things like that. And even if yourself, you know, has error, you would still be honest about the error. Yeah. So could we say it's more sort of like a self-honesty? Yeah. If we could have those mobiles off, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next on the list was another one from our thesaurus, our internal thesaurus, which was embellished, frilly, polished and marketed. It's something that we often see in pseudo-spirituality. So this is five now. So what would be the opposite of embellished, marketed, um, polished? What would that be? Uh, Fab? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, dance. We'll, we'll wait for the moment. <laughs> um, it's really raw. So raw? raw yes. Like... Raw? Yeah. David yep. had his hand up. Um, it's, it stands on its own. Like it doesn't need people to promote it. Excellent. So yes, it stands. It's just true as it is. On its own. It doesn't need people to embellish it, pretty it up, make it marketable, make it nice, pretty picture, any of those kind of things. Yeah? Yeah. It presents itself as it truly is every single time. Yeah. So would you call it unedited? Yes. Yeah. Well, my pen's going to run out here. Yeah, you got another, another blackie yeah, for me? Yeah. Thanks, babe. Unedited? Say kind of messy, like that's <laughs> who you are. Like <laughs> it's just messy. Like if you're in a mess, you're in a mess. Well, yeah. it allows a mess, doesn't it, it? it? You could say, in the end of the day, God's uh, all of God's systems all all create order, but 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 we're allowed to be a mess until we create order. Yeah. We're, we're it's not we're not we're not sort of um, condemned for making messes. Either in our lives or, or, or in our in our day to day activities or anything like that. Although, as we progress with true spirituality, we will become more orderly in the way we do things. Right? Um, it's kind of organic in its growth. Yes, so it it, it grows naturally. You could yeah. say. Yeah. yeah. So, would you say once you are engaged in certain principles, then it will continue to? Grow and develop? Is that what you mean by organic? Uh, I'm, I'm asking. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, do, what do you mean by organic, yeah. uh, Matt? <laughs> um, I, I guess I was m uh, more looking at terms of, like, for instance, how a, how a certain truth or something would grow on earth rather than, like, as a As, a, as, as a an movement. individual, yeah. Not, not so much as an individual, but, like, within groups and yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. How so it will sort of naturally expand without you having to force it to grow or, yeah. or, or even force its will upon another. So it's sort of like you see with a lot of religions historically, the way they were expanded yeah. was they went to war with a place and colonised it and forced the religion down their throats and then it became a part of that society. Whereas, uh, whereas true spirituality wouldn't do that ever. It would never force itself upon another group of people. What's uh, next in the list? Next one. Pandas, pseudo-spirituality panders to fear and grief. So what would be the opposite to pandering to fear and grief? Yes, but let's define it more. So that, the comment that was made, and by the way, please <laughs> <laughs> use the microphones, because the trouble is that anybody listening to this can't then can hear. So what was the comment? Uh, just um, unconditional love. It does. So let's be more specific about what that um, does with regard to fear. So how does that relate to fear? What, 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 what would we say true spirituality does with fear? Acceptance. Of so firstly, accepts. does it accept fear? No, it's... It, yeah. it drives yeah. out fear, right? So what could we say there? It confronts fear. Is that a good mm. way of saying it? So it confronts fear? Yeah. I was going to say it uh, recognises fear for what it is. 
not an all-encompassing thing, but just an emotion you need to release. Exactly. It's just an emotion. So yeah. it's false expectations appearing real and it recognises that. It doesn't honour doesn't honor fear. So um, quite a lot, oftentimes I see people still honouring fear. And when I say honouring fear, what I mean by that is they, they give you all the explanations in the world as to why they should still stay in fear. Right? And, and the truth... True spirituality doesn't do that. It, it never allows uh, this excuses for fears. So, so it doesn't allow you to keep on excusing your own fear all the time. It wants you to confront it. It wants you to deal with it and address it emotionally. Yeah, it's good. Anything else you can? There was, there was grief in there too, wasn't there? Yes. So, what what is what does true spirituality do with grief? Any ideas? Well, so it allow, allow allow grief. Grief is a healing emotion. Yes, uh, most people who have been involved in any so type of psychology would know that once you get to the grieving stage, that that's when you get to the healing stage. So, so true spirituality would allow grief. It wouldn't be always trying to shut down grief, always trying to make the grief go away. It would allow the grief so that the person fully experiences the grief and then they're over it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. Yeah. I just wanted to ask about, wouldn't it allow all emotions? Because some religions don't even allow joy. It's not a... So, it's, you know, there's joy somewhere in there as well, isn't there? Yes, it will allow all emotions, but it will not pander to all emotions. Can you see a difference? So, for example, it will allow fear, but it will not pander to fear. So it will not respond to fear in a negative way. It will always respond in a loving manner. So it allows all emotion, but it does not always embrace the emotion in the sense of following it to be truthful. It allows the emotion to be felt without pandering to the emotion, without living in the emotion in many cases. So, so for example, if we're living in grief and 10 years later we're still grieving and 20 years later we're still grieving, there's something wrong, right? Because true spirituality would heal us. If, 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 if the grieving process was real, it should heal us. So if we're still grieving 20 years later, there's something wrong. There's some kind of unlovingness in there that's caused us to still grieve 20 years later. We, we find that a lot of people uh, feel quite confronted by that. You know, the fact that you should, you should if you're following through a, on a truly spiritual path, you will get over things, emotionally get over things. Not, not intellectually, but emotionally you will get over things. Um, and true spirituality, that's a good mark of true spirituality. When somebody, you can see somebody's getting over the, over the grief they have or getting over the shame, not living in the shame. I've known many, uh, many people who, were involved in, who had been involved in child abuse when they were young and many of them have gone to you know, therapists and so forth for, for long periods of time but they're still not over the grief of their child abuse. And that tells me that something is going wrong with the process because after a while, once we go through the proper process, we will definitely get over it completely. We'll, we'll be able to even relate the whole event without grieving the events uh, and without feeling um, any more emotion about the events. So we'll remember the events without feeling the emotions. Yeah. So is it really that um, joy is a natural progression or a natural result? Yeah, I feel joy is going to be a natural result of true spirituality. Where, whereas um, the natural result of pseudo-spirituality is often... Um, the opposite to that, you know, a lot of uh, difficult emotions, painful experiences, stagnation, feel a feeling of, ah, oh, you know, I can't really find any answer, so a feeling of hopelessness. A lot of those feelings are associated with what I'd call pseudo-spirituality. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Matt, you would like to say? Oh, oh we, no, sorry, we were... Just on that one, AJ. Yep. It says that you're saying that it allows grief. And, you know, 20 years of grief is too long. But it doesn't have a time limit on how much grief you need to feel, does it? Like no, it doesn't have a time limit. But the fact is that if we're not changing on a particular emotion, then we're not actually getting to the real emotion. 
So there's got to be some uh, something else. Wouldn't happening. say you've got a week to feel the grief and you're done. Like no, it wouldn't do that. No. It wouldn't say you've got a week and then it should be over and done with. But it also wouldn't be five years later going. Why are you still grieving about that? Like there's something wrong if you're still grieving about that five years later. Something's not coming out of you. There's some belief system that's out of harmony with truth inside of you. If you're still grieving about exactly the same thing five years later, for example. Yeah. And, it, and that applies even if there is a death of some kind of a friend or a loved one. If you're still grieving it five years later, there's got to be some false belief that's driving the grief that you need to look at. So, for example, um, a lot of people grieve most of their life after they lose a loved one because they don't believe very strongly in any form of life after death. That's one of the main reasons why we grieve, because we feel it's hopeless now, we've lost them forever. And that's a false belief too. False beliefs always create pain. And if we're constantly grieving, then, it mean, then often it means that we're locked in a false belief. Yeah. And we do need to address that. We need to have a look at that belief. So sometimes we prefer to have that belief than a different belief that would actually relieve us from all grief. Um, just on that same point then, would it be right to say that um, true spirituality then gives us the tools and support that we need to manage these range of emotions? Yes, although I wouldn't say manage them, it's more release them. Um, it's sort of like uh, the, the desire to manage emotion comes very much from the intellect, whereas the desire to release them comes from this soul-based feeling that you can release them and be safe through the process of doing so. So I would say that... that it gives you the tools to be safe through the process of release of the emotions uh, rather than sort of managing the emotion. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Relating to some of what you've said, yesterday we said that pseudo-spirituality is often shallow and no one has to really change. Their so what would true spirituality be if pseudo-spirituality is shallow, not needing to change? Uh, so let's, let's get the mic. Uh, it'd go to quite a deep level and would require change. Okay, so it's going to go deep into your heart, sort of deep inside of you emotionally. And it requires change. This one's no good either. <laughs> so that has to be replaced. It's a pseudo, pseudo pen, pen yeah. We've got a collection of them here. Yep. So. <laughs> The trouble with some of them is they don't come off once they're on, even though they're whiteboard markers. <laughs> so, AJ, would you say, just on this point, that it, it always causes change when we engage true spirituality? And if we link that to Fab's point, so once I engage this process of grieving with the tools that the other lady talked about... Yep. Change will always happen even if I'm not finished with the grieving? Yes. Like is that a fair statement? The truth is that the grief will change as you're releasing it. So, so you, you will be different. You will know you're different. Somebody, somebody can come up to you six months later and go, boy, you feel different. And that's a good sign that you've made some change in your life when they can feel there's some positive differences in you and they haven't seen you for six months or 12 months. Um, what happens many times with pseudo-spirituality, you can meet the same person 10 years later and they seem exactly the same as what they were 10 years ago. And that's not a very good sign, if that's the case. Yeah. Okay. Did you, is it that pen working? Sorry? Did you find a pen that works? Well, then? I'm a bit concerned how it's going to rub off, but All we'll right. see how we go. Okay. Okay. What's next? Next one. We had, and you've touched on this already, that pseudo-spirituality is often intellectual and condemning of feelings. Okay, so Sorry. what would true spirituality be? Di? Emotional. Emotional? But not just emotional, because we said earlier that it's also logical. So it has to be a combination of logic and emotion. So, so you can say it's logic and emotion. All right. And if, if pseudo-spirituality condemns... What would feelings, we had here. Condemns feelings. What would, what would true spirituality do with feelings? It would allow them, support them. Um, David? That's the same point. It would just help develop 
feeling so you can sort of understand, you know, what's true and what's not true? Yes, and it's very important where you use and develops feelings. In other words, you grow in your capacity to feel. So, so you know how a lot of times uh, in our day-to-day -day life we get quite numb to things around us. Like, this is one reason why things can happen over the other side of the world where people are dying by the millions and in, a, in our society, Western society, we can look at it and go, oh yeah, that's over there though. And, the, and that, that is an indication that there's some numbness in us about the pain of others. Whereas true spirituality would actually open us enough where we would feel, we would be able to sense that pain in others and want to do something about it inside of ourselves. In other words, we become more sensitive to other, other people's pain and our own pain. So we become more sensitive. And on that point, AJ, this is not on our list, but I'm just thinking about what you're saying. It seems to me that true spirituality would inspire change in us in all spheres of our life, not just internal change, but it would impact on how we live our life and the way we relate to other people. So, yes. So yeah. it's not going to just affect how we relate to people. It will affect how we relate to things, how we relate to the environment, how we, what we eat, what we drink, what we wear. <laughs> Everything will be changed because we've become more and more sensitive to what we're doing to, yeah. to the world around us. So um, I don't know about you, have you ever tried to find a pair of vegan shoes? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Check his out, they're See new, mine? they're really good. Yeah. I found these in Melbourne. Uh, there's, a, there's this little tiny shop in Melbourne that is a yeah. vegan shoe shop. Have you been, you know about that? Yes. And, and it's just got this beautiful variety of really lovely shoes, particularly for men actually, uh, yeah. less probably so for women. The, the, their women designers perhaps need a bit of help. But, but the men's shoes are awesome, so I bought a few of those pairs. But it's very hard to find that. And, uh, and the reason why is because we're all just so used to the killing of animals in order to provide things for us, aren't we? So, and, and so when we become more sensitive, we're even more sensitive to animals and their welfare, you know, the, the environment around us that we're more sensitive to. Yep. So based upon what you've just said, to what degree is spirituality incompatible with the eating of animals and with um, capitalism as a whole? Well, I feel with the eating of animals, spirituality is definitely totally incompa incompatible with the eating of animals in, in terms of true spirituality. Because if you look at it, it creates huge amounts of pain for those animals. It also creates a lot of pain for our environment and many people in, our, in, in the world are actually in pain as a result of our desire to eat um, animal-based food. It also takes about 10 times the amount of energy, so it's not economical to eat animal-based food. So true spirituality is not really compatible with the eating of animal-based products. Um, with regard to the second one question, what was Capitalism. that again? Capitalism. Capitalism. Um, well, obviously, anything that focuses on money as the primary thing in which we run a society is going to be confronted by true spirituality. Because in the end, we were, if we were truly spiritual, we wouldn't be putting money as our first requirement or, or the, the financial economy as our first requirement of anything occurring. And quite often, myself and Mary have commented about this when, when we travel around, because we notice, you know how they have the road, the, you know, stopping people on the, on the road while they're road, doing road works, and quite often you have, like, hundreds of cars all just sitting there, engines ticking over. Um, none of that really makes much sense from an e economical perspective. And, but because of a, a money, when I'm, I'm saying a true economical perspective, if you just look at the money, it makes sense. But if you look at everything, it doesn't make much sense. And, and if you look at what's happening in society today, we have such a strong focus, particularly in Western society, on money being the primary thing that we've got to focus on with any project, rather than it, whether it has the worth or the benefit to the population or not. So, so true spirituality would focus on benefit to the population and it wouldn't care about the money. And in fact, it would understand that money is just a construct of man. We can print more money if we decided to, if we ran our economy differently. 
we could easily have enough money to build all the things that we need. And so my feelings are true spirituality and capitalism are totally like they're poles apart from each other. And obviously, though, true spirituality doesn't attack anything either. So therefore, true spirituality would not attack capitalism. What it would do is it would actually help capitalistic society to change to a more loving, gift-based society. So it wouldn't actually attack it or, or go into protest about it. It would actually, by the process of change happening in the individual, it will cause changes throughout the society. So, for example, the more of us who live by giving gifts, every single day we just give gifts of our time and our energy and our, whatever uh, the talents that we have, we give gifts to others. You imagine if there's ten, ten people doing that, then those ten people will affect everybody they give a gift to. And if there were a thousand people doing it, then it would be a much larger effect. If everyone in Sydney just gave gifts and there was no uh, economy-based working system, but we all just gave gifts because we wanted to, then you just imagine what it would be like living in Sydney. You'd, you wouldn't have this panic <laughs> driving around <laughs> everywhere because everyone would be in the process of wanting to give the gift of either their time or their energy or whatever particular um, strength or, or talent that they personally possess to another person. And because everyone wants to give a gift, in the end other people finish up giving a gift to you. But, but in a truly developed society, there's got to be trust of that process. And in our current society, we don't have much trust. And that's part of the problem. So, yes, I feel, in answer to the question, not compatible with eating of meat and definitely not compatible with capitalism uh, either. Yeah. We have to change the way we do things. It, oh, sorry. <coughs> Mr. Taylor, you urged us to embrace true spirituality, as far as I'm concerned, without explaining it. And without, without, without explaining what constitutes true spirituality. Now, surely there's a set of criteria that should define what constitutes true spirituality, testable. But you're urging us, it seems now, on a process of transformational values, sensitivity, and uh, em encouraging us to embrace that as the standard. Now, there seems to be a very great flaw here in these two sets of values. Could you explain it, please? Well, firstly, what I'm doing is rather than um, doing what you're suggesting, what I'm saying is there are certain hallmarks of true spirituality. I'm not actually saying what true spirituality is, is at this point. Because what I want to do, and, and everything that myself and Mary we are trying to achieve, is to help people come to their own conclusions about what is the true spirituality in terms, of they, in terms of everything that you can look at on the planet in terms of investigation, what are the signs of the ones that are true and what's the signs of the ones that are fake? And, and so when we're writing down these things, we're focused not on, the, um, not on trying to define true spirituality itself, but rather on defining the characteristics of it, what, what kind of characteristics we would expect it to have. And then what we're tr saying to yourselves as an audience is, now that you can sort of see the characteristics, examine the world, look at the world itself as you see it, and then see the things that have that characteristics and start using your own like investigation and will to investigate that and find the true, what true spirituality really is. So we're not, so we're not wanting to define true spirituality here. What we're trying to do is to define its characteristics so that we can find true spirituality in the end or what is the truth in the end. Uh, does that make sense as to... It, it does, but if we just use the mic. It does, but it promotes the contradictoriness. The good that I should, I do not. The evil that I should not, that I find myself doing, says St. Paul. How do we know that we are embracing characteristics of what constitutes truth? How do we test it? Well, that's what, what we're going through uh, here. But, but these are simply characteristics you're raising now. Yes. Which may or may not be true um, in, the, in the final analysis. Well, uh, I, I would argue that they're always true. Well, like, true spirituality is always, always is stand on its own. It will always grow naturally. It will always be unedited. True spirituality will always confront fear. 
It will always allow emotion. <laughs> I'm not saying what the truth is. What I'm saying is this is what the truth should allow. If only you could determine what it is. So even the business of fear... No, I but mean, I don't think you understand where I'm coming no, from logically. No, perhaps I don't, and forgive me. <laughs> I wasn't here yesterday, so... Yep. Um, uh, there is this antidote uh, that you're using to disprove a set of uh, pseudo-spiritual gifts, uh, the subject of your essay yesterday. I wasn't here. Uh, you you even, weren't here yesterday, were I, you? I wasn't, no, so I missed that part. But yep. even confronting fear, surely I raised the answer earlier that truth drives out fear. It doesn't confront fear, it drives it out. Thereby you test its reality. As with all real true spiritual gifts, they are testable. Yes. Uh, come, let us you know, test all things. Not some things, test all things. We don't live according to a relativity ethic where everything in our own eyes is relativized and therefore we can accept it as true or discard we don't approve. That's not true spirituality. With I, great I we agree, yes, yeah. completely. Yeah. I don't disagree with what no. you're saying um, at all. So um, I'm not sure what the issue is for yourself. But the issue is the contradictoriness. Uh, the issue is the contradictoriness. But what constitutes in your eyes truth? Um, love suffers long in its kind. Love or vaunted not itself is not puffed up. This is love. It can be tested. In the hard yes. area. But that's what the whole of the last two days have and been talking about. That's, that is actually one of the points that we've yeah. raised, that a true spiritual practice should be testable. Yes. You should be able to engage in it yes. and test the truth of what, of what it is teaching you mm. through your own experience. Well, Pilate had these questions and he said contemptuously, what is truth? He didn't really want to know what truth was because it didn't fit his set of criteria. Yes, but, still but we are people who are very engaged in desiring <laughs> truth, yes, Super, and well testing done. it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay, can we proceed? Yep. yep. Okay, um, well, this was, we were talking about two forms of pseudo-spirituality. Some are intellectual and condemn feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other side, often we see paths that might be uh, enjoying fake expression or okay, histo uh, histrionic. So emotional displays. So it was histrionic emotionally, yep. we said was a mark of fake spirituality. In other words, people faking their emotions. They're trying to make out that they feel love when they don't. And you soon, through the process of interacting with them, can see that they don't feel much love when you interact with them, right? Yeah. So, so, so this is where our emotional fakeness is often present in some forms of spirituality. So what would be the opposite of that in terms of... What would we expect true spirituality to be? Joy, thanks. Um, just real. Like so emotionally, emotionally real. Emotionally real. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Emotion. Oh, spell, it, spell it right. Honest. It would uh, confess our true feelings rather than what we believe everybody else wants to hear, wouldn't it? Yeah? Joy? Um, I, I realise it would require recognising your true soul condition. So in other words, I'm only going to be emotionally real if I'm... Well, it can only come from my true soul condition, I guess. It's reflecting my true soul condition. It is, but you mentioned integrity, so... It would have some integrity to it. Mm. Yeah. Um. Personal responsibility. Personal responsibility, yes. Like if it's a histrionics, it's generally probably condemning another person or being self-indulgent in some kind of way rather than responsible. Yes, yeah, so, it's, so it's not selfish or anything like that? No? Good. Okay, can we then proceed yep. to the next one? We had weak light, airy, promotes indecision is often a... Uh, and we talked a lot about this concept of indecision yesterday, didn't we? This emotion around indecision that keeps us engaged in pseudo-spirituality. So what would real spirituality do there? Igor, thank you. Uh, it, you will take action. So you take, you'll take decisions. An action. It won't be passive, will it? It won't be just sitting yeah. down there and watching the world fall apart around you without wanting to do something in the sense of to help the situation. 
Um, it allows you to make a wrong decision, so okay. like to experiment. Yep. So it allows experimentation, yeah. But what kind of experiments? Does it allow you to experiment with, a, a, with, with things that are evil or <laughs> what kind of experiment are we talking about? Right. Yeah. So how do we define healthy and safe though? <laughs> Diana, you want to? I was just going to say um, always loving. So it ha has to be loving but then we've got to define what loving is. Like. Well, something that, ta that accounts for personal responsibility, something that you said in the previous point. So if I'm engaging in experiment, I'm going to be responsible for... For, for the outcome. For the outcome, for my intention, yep. those kinds of things. And obviously, yeah. if, I, if I engage in experiments that I already know before I begin are actually going to cause pain to others, then you'd have to question the validity of the experiment, would you not? Yeah. Right? So, so it has to, they, the experiments have to be undertaken with sincerity and some integrity, don't they? Can you see that? Like, yeah. if you just undertake an experiment just because you can and knowing, well knowing that, that it might damage another person and possibly will damage another person, then of course you wouldn't engage that experiment, would you? If you, if you were in a state of love. So um, what I find is a lot of people believe that you can experiment and you can experiment with everything and anything. It doesn't matter what pain and everything it causes. Well, obviously that wouldn't be true spirituality. Okay. Yeah. Uh, something we've said here is that it's very powerful in this regard and something that occurred to me as you were talking about um, the different systems and you were saying that when we're engaged in true spirituality, we're not going to be protesting or attacking other systems, mm. but really what you were outlining is that we're going to confront error, aren't we, if we're engaged. Our yeah. own personal change will confront things around us that are not truly spiritual. Yeah, yeah, so rather than attacking in a system that's in error, it, it will still confront it just by our being there. It will confront the system that's in error. So, so when we're in a state of love and truth ourselves, it automatically confronts the error in another without us having to attack them or without us having to judge them or any of the other things, just by our living our life in harmony with truth and love, automatically the error is confronted in, mm -hmm. in some way. And that, what, that's what makes it powerful. It, we don't have to force change upon people because, because change will automatically happen through what they observe. Right? And in fact, if you look at it, forcing change on anybody, does it really work? No, yeah. not really, does it? And, and it requires a lot of very unloving behaviour generally, even right down to the threat of murder before change can occur if you're trying to force it on somebody. It's far better to engage the person in a, in a process of they de that they desire change within themselves. Yeah? Mm. And one way you can do that is by you changing and then showing them <laughs> through your own actions without even talking. You don't have to even talk. You can show them through your own actions that your change will become attractive to them and then so that therefore they'll feel drawn to make similar changes as a result of the attraction. Mm. Yeah? Okay. Okay, we talked about pseudo-spirituality often being um, entranced by the metaphysical and no soul condition improvement. So, so if, if pseudo-spirituality is entranced by the metaphysical, do you remember yesterday we talked about what that meant? Sort of being focused on the spirit body and how the spirit body works and the chakras and all of those other things... Um, while it's informa in interesting information um, and we, don't, uh, we, don't, we, we would never say to somebody, don't investigate something that's interesting, in the end, what would true spirituality be focused on in comparison to that? Do you feel? What, what's its point of focus, Eagle? Um, Soul-based. So when you say soul-based, so what, what are we talking? <coughs> that's your... Uh, feelings, emotions, uh, desires. Right. So, be so, it, so it's change of the real person, isn't it? Yeah, real you. The real you. Yeah. The f of of the actual feelings. And emotions change, and they become more loving. And truthful. 
and they become less demanding, less less expecting, less there'll be there'll be less anger, less annoyance, less frustration, all of those different things as a result. And, but it's all from the feeling. It's not like you're trying to manufacture that in your mind and change your actions, but rather it's a sincere change where you automatically find yourself acting more lovingly without even having to try because you've removed from yourself the reasons why you were unloving before, whatever those reasons were. And there's a key word that we've used to describe the hallmark of true spirituality in this regard, and it's irreversibly. Yes, yeah, so it's... It results in irreversible, irreversible change. Because obviously as you grow with true spirituality, once you've got a certain change that's occurred, let's say you've released from yourself the rage that you used to have, you can put yourself in any situation and that rage will not be present anymore. It'll just not be there anymore right no matter what anybody does to you no matter what anybody says to you no matter how much they want to damage you or cause you pain the rage still isn't there anymore right and that's a that's a good indication that you've that you've undergone an irreversible change that no matter how bad the world around you gets towards you you still have engaged this change in such a manner that you can't change back <laughs> anymore you can't change back to become more unloving again anymore. And that's a good sign of true spirituality. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yep. We talked about pseudo-spirituality often being exclusive and creating groups and cliques. So what would and be the opposite? hierarchy was another thing we talked about here yeah. yesterday as well. So, Alex? Uh, it would be all-inclusive. So it's all-inclusive, yeah. Yep. There'd be no specialness. So when you say no specialness, all of us um, are special. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, when one person seems to have been um, given a gift and they're special because they went through a process of... A, 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 oh, what's another one? But it would honour the gifts of others, wouldn't it? So, so if I recognise that you have a great mathematical mind... Let's oh, say. I'm talking about lots of spiritual, te uh, pseudo spiritual teachers. If they're an autobiography, it was a moment of a gift that they got something that other people don't have. Right. So it creates a specialness where you ha haven't got that. I've got that. So there's a an automatic inequ uh, inequality. So a person who has a gift, like all of us do, have individual gifts, though, don't 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 we? It was how we approach that gift with another, isn't it? So yeah. it'd be humble in the way that it approaches the gift with another, wouldn't it? Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, so instead of, instead of saying, oh, I've got this and you haven't got it, <laughs> you know, that, and, and be condescending towards the other, it would, be, it would be, I've got this gift if you want, I, I can share yeah. it with you type and, of a And feeling. most and authors, they say a moment of enlightenment, so it's more like um, a gift from God of them reaching a stage of enlightenment. So yes. it creates the I was given something and you haven't been given that in terms of a, a, su a supernatural um, spiritual experience that God selected them as a chosen one to give to them. Yeah. But it's not that everyone can get it. So there's this dynamic. Yeah, I've been involved in that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all It's the based, I'm better than you I'm better than you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And it's all really based around this underlying principle that we're all God's children and therefore all equal. Yes. Yeah. yes, equality. So equality is a, is, a, is a definite part of a sign of true spirituality, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And also the, um, it's the opposite of the non-ownership. It's like every, it's accessible to every, like everyone has got open accessibility. To yeah, it's accessible to all. Yeah. Yeah, very good. David having his hand up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just thinking it wouldn't actually require anyone to necessarily follow it to exist, in a sense. Um, it will. It can exist with nobody following it. Is yeah, that what you're saying? In a sense, yeah. So yeah. It can still be because everyone can be practicing pseudo spirituality, but because God exists, then it, it will still exist without, despite anyone you know necessarily following it. Because spot on, yeah. 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 Very to having groups, you know. Yeah. Having no one in a sense, yeah. as, yeah. an ex as an extreme. But yes. Yeah. yes, yeah, as the very extreme. It, yeah. Nobody could have it on earth and yet it would still exist. Yeah, that's, yes. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's very true. 
what's occurred to me from what you've been saying compared to yesterday, AJ, is that uh, you really said a moment ago, it's selfishness. Yep. As we stand back and see everyone being equal to ourselves and we have a natural response to help one another, yep. not being self-centred, yep. that to me is more a mark of true spirituality. Yep. And the other thing which you really said, which couples with that, is the desire to give and giving. Mm. Standing back from the self and giving to others seems to be more about true spirituality, whereas yesterday you're talking about people holding the truth and being self yeah. and self-centred yeah. and self-orientated, yeah. whereas spirituality is breaking those bonds and allowing people to receive the knowledge, the freedom, the ability to go out and find these things. Yeah, so it's very sharing, you could say, as well, wouldn't, couldn't you? Yeah. Has, yeah. Uh, often we see, you, you see little children not wanting to share, right? And obviously, when as a parent we see our child not wanting to share, we're automatically confronted. We can see that's not a very loving space. Um, when we are, are all sharing... And, and I mean really all sharing, where even in the Western world we're really, really ready to share with everyone in other parts of the world, then once we're really sharing, we can now start to say that we're now practising real spirituality or true spirituality by sharing. Mm. Yeah. Someone over here as well had their head up. Yeah, hi. It's uh, non-hierarchical. Yes. So, um, so could we explain more about that? Like... Anyone would like to expand on that a little? What, what do we, so with pseudo-spirituality yesterday, we talked about how generally there's a hierarchy, isn't there? Of There's the people who are more spiritual, <laughs> if you like, and then there's people who are less spiritual, and then there's people who are not spiritual, and the people who are more spiritual look down generally upon the people who are less spiritual, and you have this hierarchy, and you see this hierarchy develop in, in religions, and you see it develop in many other walks of life too, by the way, not just religions. Um, I love the distinction you made yesterday between uh, hierarchy and authority. Yes. Now, the two are very, very different. And yes. that authority is sometimes necessary in society, whereas hierarchy can be more condescending in nature and is otherwise not necessary. Exactly. Hierarchy is really saying, I'm better than you. Authority is just saying, no, we all recognise that maybe love needs to be the authority. And so, therefore, we, we can define as a society, society perhaps even what is loving, and then we all, all agree to conform to that viewpoint of love, which is, a, which is accepting the authority of love. So that's very different than hierarchy. Hierarchy is where I'm saying, no, I define <laughs> what is loving, and everybody else has to do what I want, basically. That's what hierarchy says. Now, you look at the way we run most of our companies on the, on the earth, most of it's hierarchical, isn't it? Like... You have people in a certain position of power and authority and they express that through hierarchical system. If you look at most religions on earth, they are also hierarchical in nature and that's a, that's a mark that they're not really truly spiritual yet. And we're all in a process of change. So remember that when we make these comments that we're all able to change and so therefore these systems that we have made are able to change mm. if we change. Yeah? Right. And then... Um, en encourages participation and um, individual um, real self-development? Yes, so it, it in fact in a way requires real development, doesn't it, of the individual. So individuals have to change, really. We, we can't expect everybody to go, oh, I'm just a member of this particular faith or I'm just a member of this particular political uh, process uh, without actually us actually in our, our heart, if we're truly spiritual, we will change in our heart with those particular things. Not just, it's not just an idea or concept to us anymore. It's a bit like the old, old uh, saying, you know, you, you do whatever you want during the week, but on church on Sunday you go and you get forgiven. And then, you know, that, that whole concept is really not a part of true spirituality because if you were truly spiritual, you'd want to do what, what was loving all the way through the week. And therefore, you wouldn't need to be forgiven by the time you got to the weekend for, for very much at all, except for perhaps the mistakes that you've made. Okay. There's something else that we had here. We talked about equality, but there's another quality of true spirituality that's about unifying people. So, um, 
Do you want to talk about that a bit, babe? Uh, yes. What, yep. Does anyone know what we might mean by that? Um, why, why would it be unifying? Um, I was actually going to, way back there, when talking about equality, make the point that uh, we've all got a contribution to make. Mm -hmm. um, and also the point I was going to make um, was that uh, we all have the gifts, but it depends on how we use those gifts. And quite often we say, oh, we're all equal, therefore nobody should have authority over us. But I just felt like I'm making the point that people who use their gifts to the best uh, for everybody else uh, are worthy of respect of and honouring and respect. And I think we forget that point, that there are people who have gifts and they use them to the best of their ability. Yep. They are to be respected. Yes. And, um, you know, so it's like if, we, if yeah. we're thinking from a musician perspective, um, while all of us might be able to play the guitar at some point in the future or even now, um, there will be some people who are so good at it that we would just love to go to listen to them for the whole day and there's other people that are going to be so bad at it that uh, we're probably not going to want to listen to them at all. And, and there is a whole range in between. Now, that doesn't mean that we're still not equal, does it? But it does mean that we honour the gift of a person who obviously has developed that gift. And also, if we were wanting to learn, we'd obviously want to learn from that person who has the greater... Uh, capacity to do that particular thing. So that would make sense, but that doesn't mean that we worship them. That doesn't mean that we, we then go down the track of saying that they are better than us and then we, we try to do what they want us to do and all of those kind of things because that would then be worshipping of them rather than just respecting their gift that they have. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So in terms of what Mary uh, just introduced, do you yep. want to introduce it again? Yeah. So we're, we've said here that one of the hallmarks of true spirituality is that it unifies and it draws all to itself. Why would that be? How would that be? Sorry, Dave? I feel like I'm hogging a bit. Sorry. Um, I, I was just thinking that um, because, because it promotes growth, that you don't grow as a sort of individual despite others, but in terms of growing as more of a collective. So, so when, when someone grows, it's, it's part of that growth to want to actually help others to grow rather than just grow to be enlightened despite others and I just want to be better than everyone else. If You know what I mean? So, yeah. so that unifies people. Can I sort of illustrate it as a, just a basic illustration? If, if this is God and here is me and here is Mary when we start off, and, and here's other people, like we're all very separate from each other and separate from God. And we might have different feelings, beliefs, beliefs, lifestyles, all those things. As we absorb more of God's truth and God's love, obviously we're going to get closer to God. Does that not make sense? Yeah. And as we get closer to God, what ha what's happening here is the gap between ourselves is also closing. So we are automatically becoming closer to each other as that occurs. So the beauty of the true spirituality is, it, is that it's going to draw people together. It's going to unify rather than separate. Right? And when I say rather than separate, that's if, if two people embrace true spirituality, it will draw those two people together. Now, if one person embraces true spirituality... He, he or she will get closer to God and also feel closer to their neighbour or whoever that neighbour is. But if this person is embracing pseudo-spirituality, it doesn't mean that they will feel closer to them. Does that make sense? So it just depends on whether we embrace it or not as to how close we will actually feel. But if we personally embrace true spirituality, we will automatically feel much closer to other people around us. We'll, we'll feel more love, more compassion, more understanding, more kindness towards other people around us, not less. Yep. And if we all decide to respect the authority of love, even just to respect love as the authority, then naturally we're going to act in unison, aren't we, on different topics because we'll, we'll want to respect love in every situation. Yes, yeah, so yeah. even if you and I disagree on a certain matter, we will still be close enough to love each other even though we might disagree on a certain... We won't, we won't feel all angry and upset about the fact that the other person doesn't agree. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, yesterday we said an interesting thing that was pseudo-spirituality appeals to the hearts of few, but many follow. And remember what we said there um, is that how quite often with pseudo-spirituality, you notice people living a certain life that's not really in their heart, like lots of people doing it. But if you ask them, do they really believe it? A lot of them go, oh, no, I don't really believe it, but my mum and dad are doing it, so that's why I do it. Or my friends are doing it, so that's why I do it. So it's not really in their heart, but they still follow it because of the collective pressure of, their, of the society around them. They still do it because of that. What does true spirituality do instead of that? Um, it appeals to, like... Just about everyone, but it's a real challenge to follow <laughs> from personal experience. Right. So it has it has a soul p appeal. It yeah. has a feeling yeah. appeal to the feelings. So we could say it appeals to the hearts of nearly everyone. everyone yeah. yeah. Including all my friends. Like everyone's like talking about emotions. They already already want to know what I'm doing and everything and how you guys are. Like we we're debating about it yesterday, but it's like, oh, I think I'd like to come today, but. No, I'd rather do something else. But it's appealing, but it's a challenging. Yeah. So with true spirituality, it appeals to the hearts of all, generally, when they hear it, if they're open enough to hear it, but few are courageous enough to follow it. That, that is definitely a mark of true spirituality. And one of the reasons why, of course, is because it requires change. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are resistive to change. Uh, you know, they don't want to change or they feel that there's little point in changing and so forth. Um, so it's like the narrow path. It's a, it's a narrow way. And because it's narrow, um, few people f actually follow it, even if they do find it. Um, but few, few follow it. Yep. So in the end, we hope that uh, it's the opposite to that. <laughs> that. That everyone feels the appeal of it in their heart, and then they also want to follow it. That, that would be, that'd be a perfect world, wouldn't it, basically? Uh, if everyone wanted to embrace love, truth and humility and follow that. Okay. Next up. Any more? Any, no? any more? Let's move no? on. Okay. Yesterday we said pseudo-spirituality appeals to error, injury and addictions. So it appeals to error, injury and addictions. So, so what does uh, true spirituality do? Alex? Uh, confronts all addiction. So it confronts addictions... It doesn't allow people to justify their addictions. It, it gets people to examine them and look at them and release them. Right. What does it appeal to? What does it lead you to look for in all situations? It appeals to truth and love. And yeah, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think it also appeals to investigation, people with an inquiring mind. It, That's who it, it certainly does. To. to investigation, yeah. And it, and it, in fact, allows investigation too. It doesn't condemn it. Oh, it pretty much desires it, really. It yeah. desires it. That's a very good word. Desires. Because the truth will hold up no matter what until the truth changes and becomes something else. Exactly, exactly. So, so this whole idea that you can't um, investigate something else other than truth. Like, many religions have this idea that if you investigate something outside of the boundaries of their particular tenets and their particular ideas that they will excommunicate you from their religion. Now, if it was a true-based religion, it wouldn't do that because it would allow and desire investigation because in the end, it has enough confidence in the truth to know that it will always be exposed in the end. Yeah. Well, would you say this is because God is a dynamic being? Uh, yes, and also a truthful one. Um, so, so anything that God creates, God wants us to know what the truth is and God wants us to find it and once we have a desire to find it, a seeking attitude, you know, we keep on knocking and we keep on asking, we will get it. And uh, this is a, a mark of a loving God, actually, that God will always give what we sincerely desire. If it's in harmony with love, we will always receive. 
Yeah. And that's something we need to always remember as well. So the, so the true spirituality desires truth. That's a bit different than just allows it, isn't it? Don't you find? Desires it instead. Yeah? Now, a lot of times uh, we think we desire truth, but then when somebody tells us the truth about <laughs> ourselves, <laughs> then we often don't desire it, yes? So, so we would even need to desire the truth about ourselves, God's truth about ourselves, whatever that truth is. Uh, and it's like looking in the mirror and seeing us, ourselves warts and all type of feeling. Yeah? Kathy and I were talking last night about what you said yesterday, that we have to be true to ourselves, that pseudo-spirituality allows you to um, come up with facades. Yes. And if we put those facades up and we're not our true self, then God's not learning what it is because we're not being truthful entities to let God know what these expressions are through us. Yes, and I, I would actually say, though, that God does know who we truly are, but God's wanting us to, to know ourselves. Like, and so, therefore, if we've got the facade up, God's going, well, how can I interact with you with this facade? I, I can only interact with you at the true level that I, that I know is there, uh, underneath all this facade, you know, underneath all of this uh, this. Uh, picture that you've built for yourself because you can't cope with what I've created is okay. what God feels, you know. Like, so if you look at it from God's perspective, God's created a beautiful, perfect individual. What we've done is muddied the water with facade, and it's not just ourselves that have done it. It's often how we were brought up and how we've lived in society and all these other things that have muddied the waters and therefore have created the facade. But uh, God wants to interact with the real person, not with the not with the person who's, behind, who's, who's the facade. He wants to react with the person behind the facade, the real individual. Yeah. And I suppose that would be another hallmark of true spirituality, isn't it? That it would encourage us to engage our will. To, yes. Yeah. So let's look at that. So that we can discover ourselves and God. In a loving way, shall I? Yes, definitely. So in other words, uh, true spirituality, if a person is engaging their will in an unloving manner, what would true spirituality do there? It would at least speak up, wouldn't it? It would at least say, actually, I feel that's an unloving thing that you've just done or, or just said or whatever or just... just you know, treated me like or whatever. But on the reverse edge of that, it would also say whenever we notice anybody being loving or we would always be encouraging other people to be loving and using their will in a loving way. They can do whatever they want as long as they use their will in a loving manner. So true spirituality would not try to control people's will. Right? It would allow the freedom of expression of their will but it does stand up for it being in a loving manner. So in other words, it does have something to say about whether it's loving or not. It's good. Anything else you'd like to say about that? So let's go back up to here. A okay. few more yet to go. Yep. One of the things that you've already touched on in terms of an answer, but we said yesterday that pseudo-spirituality is arrogant it denies the true self and true condition. So what would be the opposite of arrogance and denying your true self? So, uh, humble. So humble? Just and self-reflective. Self-reflective, yeah. Yep, yeah. it admits to its faults, doesn't it? Would it be also selfless? Selfless. In what way can we define selfless? No. Well, not concentrating on yourself, like we were saying before, to, to stand back and see others like yourself, to help them, to make yeah, space. Yeah, can I define it as to wanting to give? Or it's leading us to serve, could we say to that? To give? Yeah. Wanting to serve. We would still be in connection with ourselves, though, and our own desires. Of our course. own. We'd yeah. still have a desire to 
care for ourselves as much as we do to care for others. Because you wouldn't want to serve others that, to your own detriment because yeah. then, of course, you know, you'd never be able to, you, you know, your own, your own self degrades and then you can't serve anybody. Yeah. So it would have that respect for yourself still, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I was thinking more like a, I have a child and I'd like to see it and give it the opportunity to learn. Not yes. to hold it back. I was seeing it in those yep. terms. So, so you could say it is not. Um, uh, it, it's. Uh, there's a word for that. Now I'm just trying to look for it. Um, yeah, altruistic is probably the word I'm looking yeah. for. Yeah. How do you spell altruistic? Oh. He's stick. That's it. Yep. Yeah. In it. In the sense that, in the sense that it's always looking for what's going to benefit the other person, not just itself. You know, in today's society, we see that most of the time we're just looking to benefit ourselves. Well, how can we benefit ourselves? And 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 yet, it, true spirituality would always be looking for how can we benefit everybody here, not just ourselves. And it, and it even has a feeling of forgetting oneself to a large degree. It doesn't mean that you wouldn't care for yourself because you would still do that. But you, you forget yourself in the process and you, you, you're working for a greater good rather than just for your own good. So I think Mary is touching on it, but could you expand on that concept of martyrdom? Because most <laughs> spirituality, um, you know, particularly the female role, yeah, yeah. You, you seem to be a martyr and it's... Um, very good to put everyone else first and yourself last. Yeah, this whole idea that a good mother is a good martyr, basically. Yeah. <laughs> is, is I've been trying a, to put that into practice, but it, it hasn't been the a great re result. <laughs> no, no, there's not, not much good result from martyrdom. Let's have a look at it. That is... Which is, which is something that um, a lot of women are taught to be from a very young age, is it not? Like, you know, in terms of you've got to look after your family, feed yourself last, you know, do all of these things. And this, from God's perspective, if we look at it, if, if you and I are equal, then I should love you to the same extent I love me. Is that not the case? Is that the, in the Bible, love others as you love yourself? As you it's love yourself. It's kind of assuming you love yourself. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a big that. assumption, isn't it? <laughs> and, yeah. many, and many don't. I agree. <laughs> and, but this is what we need to develop. Is if, if we are loving of others more than we love ourselves, we'll eventually become exhausted. We'll eventually become so tired that we can't do anything. If we love ourselves more than we love others, then we'll, we will exhaust others. Does that make sense? So if you look at, uh, you look at the process of exhaustion, so let's say this is myself... And this is others. All right. If I love others more than myself, I become exhausted. If, if I drag others into looking after me or loving me more than I, I love myself or more than I love them, then they will become exhausted. Either one is not loving. Now, if you apply that to a family with a mother, then obviously you can see that a mother needs to love herself as much as she loves her children. Right? So is that tying with self-responsibility? Very, very much so. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yep. And it's difficult, isn't it? Because we have so many um, different ideas about what it means to love oneself, doesn't it? You know, some of us it's, well, I should get whatever I want all of the time. And, and that's not loving yourself. No, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and for some, it's other people should, I should be able to give other people what they want all of the time and that's not loving yourself either. Or, or them. them. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, the reality is if you look at a lot of our children in today's society, many of them grow up with a very, very strong demands because their parents have taught them that their parents are going to love them more than they love themselves. Yeah? And, and as a result, the children grow up believing that, that they should get everything they want to the parents' detriment. Now, if a parent truly loved themselves, they would not allow that kind of unloving behaviour to develop in their child. 
Yes. Because also, if they truly love their child, they wouldn't want to breed a sense of entitlement in their child because yep. that would lead them to be an unloving person with everyone in their life. Yeah. And you see a lot of mothers doing this now, like with their children. They sort of allow their children to do everything and anything they want and allow them to yell and scream at them and demand everything from them and all these kind of things without restraint. And as a result of that, the mother just feels totally exhausted, <laughs> which is the result of loving someone else or, or giving to someone else more than you're giving to yourself. So, so if you truly love others, you would not engage that process with them, particularly if they were demanding. You would actually have to confront their demands at some point. Yeah. yeah. So there needs to be balance. And with love, there is always balance. There is an equality with it. Loving yourself as much as you love everyone around you. Yep. So if I, if, I have a, if I love myself, I will be interested in my welfare. I will be concerned about my respon taking responsibility and all those kind of things. I will be. But if I love you as much as I love myself, I will, I will do exactly those same things for you. And I'll actually help you do the same thing for yourself. Yep. So martyrdom is not very... Uh, uh, you could say not, not very in line with true spirituality, do <laughs> you? It's not very truly spiritual at all. Yeah. There's something else we said here just on that point. Uh, we've talked about wanting to be self-reflective and connect to the real self, but what we're actually saying is that true spirituality requires a passion for the real self, a de passionate desire for our real selves. Yep. So not just a begrudging admitting of who we are. <laughs> I've got <laughs> ten people last week tell me that I'm something, and oh, I suppose I have to accept it. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's more like I want to know what, what I truly am. I want to understand my feelings properly. And, and in particular, I want to understand that so that I can become more loving so that I can become less, less selfish, so that I can help others better. So it's not, it's not driven by even a selfish motive that I'm more loving than you and I can prove it sort of thing. It's driven by a motivation of wanting to serve. Yeah. Okay. okay. We talked about pseudo-spirituality being self-reliant and us becoming a law unto ourselves. Okay, so what's the opposite of that? Um, becoming God-reliant. Okay. What does that mean? Di? Um, wanting to know God's laws and wanting to um, abide by God's laws and, um, and also respecting the authority of um, the country or the place in which we live as yep. long as it doesn't conflict with God's laws yes so we want to know god's laws and principles so we'd want to try to discover them we'd we'd be prepared even to experiment to discover them wouldn't we Prin principles yeah. we'd be prepared to experiment to try to discover what god's laws are on any particular subject certainly what else would we do uh, yeah. if it just oh, sorry who if oh, it, maybe if putting it. god first as well Yes, so we'd, ha we'd be putting God first. What does that mean? <laughs> all, all of the things that we've talked yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, I don't feel it means denying oneself, no. Why not? Definitely don't. Because, because to put God's first, I have to acknowledge myself. I have to acknowledge my desires. I have to know that one of my strongest desires is God first. Mm -hmm. So I have to know myself rather than deny myself. Right. So, Yvette, can I continue with you? Yeah, um, yeah to, it's for basically all the things that we've said and being completely humble and honest and developing a relationship with God, being open emotionally. So, we're really needing to be open to God telling us things about ourselves. Yeah, like the feedback. And would you say as well, when we put God first, are you talking about as well desiring God? Yeah. More than we desire other things. Anything, <laughs> else, anything else, our addictions or yes. anything else, it's desiring yeah. God and God's love. Yeah, so if you desire God first, what, what will happen to the rest of your desires? 
they'll, okay. they'll be underneath that, won't they? So, <laughs> so if, you look at, uh, if you look at a priority list in our lives, what we'd, we'd have God first and our relationship with God's first, then you can see that everything else that we desire in our life would fall underneath that. Right? Now, in that relationship, God will show us what is the correct priority of the rest of our life if we desire God first. So the correct priorities of the rest of our life will come about through that so desire of that relationship. How will that happen, babe? What is the actual dynamic that would occur? Well, every time that I have my priorities out of harmony with God's priorities for us, when I say God's priorities for us, I mean the way that he created us to be. Every time I put myself out of harmony with God's priorities, my relationship with God is not going to be as strong as if I pull my priority system into harmony with God's priorities. And so God, through that relationship, will teach me what's out of harmony with his priorities and what's in harmony with his priorities. And therefore, what is going to be in harmony with my complete happiness. Yes. Because remember that if we do exactly as God created us to be eventually, if that's what we personally desire to do in the end, we will actually be the happiest we can possibly be because that's what God created us to do. Yeah. So there's a lot in that and, and we could have a whole four-hour discussion plus about that, but uh, we need to probably proceed. <laughs> yep, okay. Yeah. So um, we said pseudo-spirituality is self-glorifying, some of those things that Laura was talking about, and promotes self-interest. Right, so what's the difference between self-glorifying, promoting self-interest, that's pseudo-spirituality, what would real spirituality be? We've already um, mentioned some I of it, was about, we? Sorry, I was about to mention that uh, um, really recognising that we are children of God and that we are, and God wants to, us to sort of... You um, mean on the previous point? You were on the previous point still? Yeah, then, no, that, uh, right. recognise that... We, yes, I was going to go on the <laughs> previous point, but okay, then the okay. next that goes into this point is that if we believe that we're children of God and God loves us, then he's wanting us to fulfil um, our desires... Through with, th with with his uh, aid, because when I was doing the homework, I thought, well, when I was a Christian and uh, younger, all I wanted to do was find out what God's will was for me and do it, and that had nothing to do with me. Um, but now I realise that uh, I need to be integrated with God, but mind, body, and spirit mm -hmm. um, integrated with um, finding out every instant what God wants with me. Not on top of imposing on me. If yeah, you, I, you, I would even I say it more, I'd probably <laughs> define it even more closely than that. I would say what God wants us to do is to discover ourselves yeah. as God created us exactly. to be yeah. and then follow that with a passion. And when we do, we will actually be much more connected to God as a result yeah. and, uh, and therefore have a stronger relationship with God because because if it's like uh, it's like a parent with a child the parent doesn't force the child to decide what it wants what the parent does is it tries to engage the child's will so the child discovers what it wants but but wants things that are only loving so it teaches about so, love so it teaches the child about yeah. love and that's what God is doing with us so, so what God's attempting to do is teach us about love. Now, these are all parts about love, like love is humble and it's self-reflective and it admits it's right, it's selfless. It, these are all parts of, of what love does. But, but if we think about it from a desire perspective, what God desires for us is that we discover our own desires that God has already inbuilt in us <laughs> and we follow that with a passion in harmony with love. All right? But God gives us the free will to do it out of harmony with love as well, if that's what we want. Understanding, of course, that pain will be the result if we follow that. And pleasure will be the result if we follow it in harmony with love. Yeah. So, it's un un so if we go back to the point, though, with... Okay, well... <laughs> where, where where uh, track of yes, no. We said it was self-glorifying. Uh, the pseudo-spirituality and promotes self-interest. And conversely, true spirituality... Is that rain? Beautiful, rain, hey? Beautiful. Um, God-glorifying and creates an awareness of God. Okay, so, so it glorifies God. Um, 
And I feel too, it also glorifies what the gifts we see in other people. Mm. Like, so when I see a, a God given gift or talent being used in another person in a loving manner, I feel a strong desire to, to give glory to that, give glory yeah. to God, if you like, for me seeing that in, the, in another person, because that is a part of God's creation in that person. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a very powerful thing when we start to, to go away from self-glorification and focus on lauding and honouring what God has created in all of us. And all of us have been created with different talents, different abilities, different um, um, beautiful characteristics that we need to see in each other. We need to see them and not be competitive with them. We need to see them and enjoy them. With, in, in our interactions with each other. Yeah, along the same lines, I feel that it glorifying all of us as God's greatest creation. It's that part of it. Yes. So, yes, we're all equal and we're all special. Yes. And remember, in his hierarchy, we are his greatest creation. And Yeah, and is, is there a hierarchy? <laughs> in, in, I suppose in, the, in, in, in terms life. of animals and, yeah. you know, if you look at all the creations of God, the human soul is the greatest of those creations. Mm. Um, but in that human soul... There is so much individualised characteristics right across the board that we can't actually say that one person is better than another because, but, because each single individual has a unique characteristic and attribute inside of them somewhere. It's just a lot of times they haven't discovered it yet. But it's somewhere inside of them that nobody else has. And this is a, a very powerful thing for us to start to discover in our interactions with people. Yes? If we come over here. He's got the mic yep. on that Quiet. side. Yes. Yep. Um, we're here to glorify God, but yet we are blind and rebellious and sinful, and therefore we're reaching to something which we can't define. Now, he who is the source of all love chastens us. Um, whom he loveth, he chasteneth. Now, that's very painful. That is in my experience. I don't know if you care to comment on that. Where we don't glorify God, we love God because he first, uh, he first loved us. And we're putting, therefore, the cart before the horse in this respect. And we, your your utopianism... Your, what, what was your name? Sorry, can uh, I... John is my name. John, yep. I'm a friend of David here. Yep. yep. Um, I spent many years in Papua New Guinea among cargo cults and sorcery and witchcraft. Yep. Very powerful spirituality, if you like. Yep. I was a key up, an administrator. And so we've seen at the very root level of sorcery and witchcraft what these demonic spirits can do. They are real. But I, I'm concerned about your utopianism here, that we can determine the course of our responsiveness to the great source of love and that we thereby glorify him. Are you not putting the cart before the horse? <laughs> we are blind and rebellious. No, I can't agree, John. At our core level, God created us without sin. And we have chosen to sin. So it's a choice that we made to act out of harmony with love. If you remember the words in the Bible where Jesus said, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, if Jesus stated those words, then he had a full intention that we're able to become perfect, yes? Well, he said, be perfect, as my Father in heaven which is perfect. I agree. That's the same. I know what I said. I was there. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you use the microphone. Um, uh, the commandment is, be perfect, even as my Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. We are incapable. We are blind, blinkered, rebellious, scornful. We I can't, need, I we can't need agree. repentance. I can't agree. Jesus wouldn't have said to be something that was impossible to be. And, and so I can't agree that we were created in, in a, a rebellious, blind and scornful and sinful I feel that's a very Christian viewpoint uh, uh, that is in mainstream Christianity, but it is not what Jesus was reflecting. And so when, when I spoke those words in the first century, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, I meant that we are totally capable of being perfect. And we are. The reality is we are. Only if we choose to act in harmony with love will we be. And this is where I feel... 
there's this whole viewpoint in many religions, and it's not just in Christianity, this whole viewpoint that God created a flawed being that then needs rescue from God but through God's acts is a, is a flawed and illogical, is illogical because God created a perfect being that decided using its own will to become flawed and therefore must decide using its own will to become perfect. And that's why those words were stated, to be perfect. You can be perfect. That is my belief. Um, and my belief is quite strongly that uh, I've seen people become perfect, so, so you can be perfect, even coming from an imperfect state. So you can make choices that cause you to become perfect, but only by the heart changing. The heart has to change in order for somebody to become perfect. That's, that's what I feel. And what's the next point? Can we move on? Sure. To okay. Uh, Pseudo-spirituality is self-righteous and inflates the soul in denial. Okay. So let's uh, look at that. So what's the opposite of self-righteousness? Self-lording. Um, could you not yell out, please, John? <laughs> uh, we need on, on the microphone. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, so, what is the opposite of self-righteous? <laughs> Would it be humble? Um, yes, but there's more to it than that, isn't there? What, what is self-righteousness? Can you define self-righteousness? Yeah, feels like it. Sorry. Uh, if we come over here with the mic. If you, if you could just remember to put up your hands when you come uh, because uh, otherwise we don't hear it. Uh, yep. Arrogance. So arrogance is, a, is self-righteous. A well, a component of. It, can you see that self-righteousness is sort of a feeling inside of yourself that, that you are more righteous S than superiority. another? Superiority. Yes, it's a feeling of superiority. So, so what would, would, would be the opposite to that? Not inferiority, <laughs> because that would be making somebody else superior. Yeah. So what would be the opposite to this feeling of superiority? Who's got the mic? Laura. <laughs> a, a willingness to succumb to a new way, a new belief for a new way. So it's um, like a, sub, a surrendering of a, sta a stance. Um, can I give a bit more background info about self-righteousness? Usually self-righteousness comes into play when we believe we have the right viewpoint of something and so therefore we believe another person has the wrong viewpoint and then what we do with that is we feel that we are superior to the other person because we have the right viewpoint. Does that make sense? That's self-righteousness. So, so what would we do if we weren't self-righteous even when we knew we had the right viewpoint? <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. There are times when you know that you have the truth and you have the right viewpoint inside of you. What would you do with that if you were not self-righteous? Uh, you'd, you'd be allowing... Okay, so you'd be allowing of other. of other and other someone else to actually hold another viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and to not just to allow, just to allow. And so you wouldn't have a feeling of condescension towards the other person. Does that yeah. make sense? Condes oh, yeah. So, so there'll be no feelings of condescension. Condescension. Yep. Uh, Can we sum, sum it up as a respecting a gift of free will for others? Uh, we would respect others, yes. And not just with their free will, but or, or whether they exercise their free will negatively or positively, we would still respect them. Yes. Anything else? Um, I guess you wouldn't talk about it so much, um, you just demonstrate it by the way that you, you're acting towards that person instead of keep telling them what you think is true despite what, you know, what, what's going on, you'd be so sort of sensitive to what's happening. Yes, so you wouldn't feel anger or frustration or resentment towards a person, would you? No, I don't for, think so. For them, being, for them not understanding your perspective or point of view? Yeah, good. Yeah. You might in, um, offer truth. In, you would, you would still offer it. You would always offer it because that's a gift, isn't it, to offer it. But you wouldn't expect the person to 
to listen or take it mm. or to act upon it. You wouldn't have a demanding attitude towards them, yeah? And just uh, no judgment. No, no judgment, yes, no judgment. So if we define judgment, judgment is a feeling coming out of you that you're better than someone else. So, so you wouldn't have that feeling, so there'd be no judgment. Yep, so for, where's the mic? <laughs> oh, yeah. Got to keep up with all the... You would still have compassion for that person even if you didn't agree with their viewpoint. Yes, so you would have compassion without condescension. Yeah, that wouldn't be all <laughs> icky and condescending. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I, I find I've struggled with that myself personally and I've been working on it recently over the past few months. Yep. But what happened to me a lot in the past was um, if somebody didn't accept my viewpoint or agree with it, um, I would find myself getting frustrated or angry or upset with the fact that they couldn't see how right I was. <laughs> yes, yeah. And yeah. so to learn to let go of that has been an interesting experience. Yes, it's a, quite an emotional experience learning to let go of that because you've got to allow yourself mm -hmm. to go through what the anger and frustration is all about, don't you, and, and find out. And usually you find out there's some fears in there, some childhood fears and grief. Eventually. Ironically, it's often because we've been made to feel so silly when we, we well, were wrong yeah. <laughs> about yeah. something. So now we really need other people to validate that we're right and yeah, yeah all kinds yeah. of things. Yeah. But it's very powerful to give up that emotionally because then you can live the truth yourself without expecting anyone around you to do that. And, and so that then creates a desire in others to go, Oh, what's going on for you? Why is this happening for you? What, you know, you seem to be living a different life now and, you know, they ask more questions and therefore they're more open to actually hearing uh, by you releasing that particular emotional stance, yeah. Yep. Okay, if we come down. Front. Um, I haven't heard the word ego mentioned at all. Ego is not a dirty <laughs> word. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and I suppose the way that people on earth use the word ego, it is a bit of a dirty word, yes? Um, in uh, the spirit world, in the higher spheres of the spirit world, ego just means the soul, the, the person's individual nature, um, uh, which is what it comes from. But, but that's been transformed now on earth into this idea that if you're egocentric, then you're self-centric and, uh, and so forth. And, and my feelings are about ego. It would be more, probably more accurate. Instead of calling it ego, let's, let's call it self-centeredness, shall we? And of, co of course, if we're self-centered, we're out of harmony with love and therefore out of harmony with true spirituality. Yep. So if we, if we use ego as that definition... It, it comes from a Greek, a Greek word that hasn't got that definition, though. So <laughs> that's the trouble. Uh, sometimes we can use words that have different definitions. And, and have you noticed that over the last hundred years, even words in the English language have changed completely in their definition? Like, yeah, it's uh, amazing how that happens over time. Something else that we've said there uh, is that true spirituality is very down-to-earth. So rather than being self-righteous, it's down-to-earth. And um, rather than inflating the soul in denial, it actually forces the soul into reality. Mm. Okay, so should we write some of those down? Mm -hmm. 21. Down to earth. What's another... I know this is sort of, this is sort of a colloquialism, isn't it? What's an authentic. Authentic, yeah. I'm happy just to have the one word yell out. So. <laughs> <laughs> Authentic, because I can write them down <laughs> as fast as you can say them. <laughs> yep. Authentic. It's more than that, isn't it? It's really the lack of facade. It's just being ourselves. Isn't being it? our as authentic yeah. self. So true spirituality will encourage you to be your authentic self. It'll, it'll be promoting your authentic self. It won't be encouraging you to maintain a facade so that everybody else... Uh, it likes you. I, I know with a lot of religions, uh, and I've been in some of them <laughs> myself, where um, it, you had to maintain a certain type of uh, stance, otherwise you would receive the direct condemnation of the rest of the group. And what that does is it doesn't encourage you to be your authentic self, particularly in some areas. Um, 
Whereas if, if, a, if true spirituality encourages you to be your authentic self, then it would be accepting of all of your flaws. It would be, when I say accepting, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't expel you because you have those flaws. Right? So uh, in the first century, I was well known for accepting prostitutes, um, people who were terrorists, um, people who were murderers, drug users, and so forth, into my company. Does that make sense? Uh, just as I am now, actually. <laughs> now that doesn't mean that I am. <laughs> that doesn't mean that I am any one of those things, and that doesn't mean that all of you are those things either. By the way, <laughs> but uh, but but we, if you accept people of all types who have all sorts of backgrounds and all sorts of things going on in their lives, then you have a great power to influence their life to change. If you already condemn them before you even in, before you can engage them then how can they ever have the chance to go through the process of change? You see, it doesn't make any sense really, does it? By re rejecting people because of their way of life, we, we automatically prevent them from discovering truth. If we accept them and their way of life and discuss with them the truth, then uh, now they have the ability to make choices. And if they make what we believe is the wrong choice, we still wouldn't be self-righteous because we'd allow them to make the wrong choice and come back to us and say, oh, yeah, I made the wrong choice. Yeah, yeah, I saw you do that, actually. <laughs> and, and we wouldn't condemn them for doing that. We'd say, well, oh, I've made many similar choices in my life as well. And, and yes, you know, that's what happens until we learn. And then once we learn, we don't do that anymore. So we'd be far more authentic. Yeah? Mm. So what, and was, what was the other thing that, was on it that you said? There was... Uh, forces the soul into reality. Yeah, this is something that's really important. The truth, true spirituality forces, and I'm using that term uh, f for a reason, the soul into reality. What do you think we mean by that? Yeah, um, one of the things I was also going to say with the down to earth is it doesn't require practices or techniques or prayer or anything that induces an experience that's um, short lasting but doesn't create a change. So yep. a meditation or a prayer or Hail Mary or... It know. does require prayer. Oh, in terms of Hail Mary, Mother of Graham, you say it 15 times. Right, so in other words, it doesn't require rote a prayer. Ritual, yeah. Or ritual. Ritual, so ritual. prescriptive, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Not No ritual. So when people come over to my place, they, they think they're coming over to have dinner with Jesus, right? And they, they almost sit there with their hands held waiting for me to say a prayer. Mm. And myself and Mary do not pray before a meal. Because we don't want it to be a ritual. My, the way I eat is my prayer. Do you understand what I mean by that? I eat with a passion. Who's ever <laughs> eaten with AJ? It's pretty Those passionate. Yeah. <laughs> know that I eat my food with a passion. And if I really like it, you know what prayer I'm saying. <laughs> it's automatically there in the feelings, you see. And, and so that's the feeling that comes out of you towards God. That's your prayer, not, not the words. Right? It's the feeling. So when I sit down to eat a meal, there's a chance when I'm eating this meal that I might not like it. So how can I... Pray about it yet. I, the way I look at it is while I'm eating about eating it, I'm going to be praying. <laughs> Does that make sense? My feelings are going to demonstrate my response to the meal. Yeah? And to the person as well who created the meal. Mm. Yeah. I, I do say to people that's not very tasty. If it's not very tasty. <laughs> <laughs> Joy? Um, I'm just looking at the forces of the soul, I guess. Yep. Um, what we're saying is that the soul can't but respond, like the, the soul will always respond. Exactly. The way God's created her universe is that eventually, given eternity, our soul is going to respond. <laughs> our soul is going to respond to God at some point. Mm. All right? Now, we have a choice as to how long that point will be. Mm. But eventually, given eternity, we're going to respond sooner or later. Because sooner or later... If we don't respond, the pain of not responding is going to be so strong that we'll want to respond. And, and so the, the way God's created the universe is, is such that sooner or later our soul will eventually respond to love. It will eventually respond. Because without love, it feels painful. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm curious to know why you referred to God as her in that sentence. Uh, because I'm trying to confront in all audiences this concept that God is just a he. Um, there's, this, there's this very strong Christian and Muslim based belief systems that have been around for thousands of years now that God is only a male or masculine in nature. And God is both masculine and feminine in nature. So for that reason, I often use he or her or mum or dad, mummy, dad, father or mother, uh, interchangeably in, our, in my discussions with people. Yeah? Yeah. In the first century, I used to call God daddy. Um, but if I called God mummy, which I often also did, but that's not recorded in the Bible, often uh, people would get very upset. In the first century. And uh, why do you think that is? Because it was a male mm. dominated society. Yep. yep. Very, very autocratic male dominated society. Yep. Okay, this whole idea that, that the truth, true spirituality, grabs the soul basically and pushes it in a direction. And as long as we engage the process, we'll, we'll go along with that direction. We can stop that at any point in time, but. The longer we stop it, the more pain we feel. So, so what's the point? <laughs> we might as well continue going. And this is after a while what we start feeling. We start feeling like, what's the point in delaying this process of feeling happier? <laughs> what's the point of delaying this process of being in more harmony with love? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And was there any more, darling, in that list? That was uh, almost it, wasn't it? Uh, there's uh, about five more things, Five actually. more things, aren't there? <laughs> so. um, what, to what is our time, by the way? We just... 10 to 3. That went fast. Um, yep. Um, okay, we'll, we'll do these five points quite rapidly and then we'll have a break for 10 or 15 minutes. What time do we finish? Four. We're four. Four we're four. going to finish okay. today. Yep. So. All right. Because we've got all the other things to discuss yet. <laughs> yeah. That's quite a few. So maybe we should just uh, skip through them. Yep. Yesterday we said that pseudo spirituality gratifies the animal. So, so what, what do true spirituality do? Gratify, satisfy the soul. The soul. Yeah, the the feelings inside of you are going to be truly satisfied if you if you embrace it. Yeah. And something interesting we said yesterday um, was that the world is invested in staying addicted to pseudo spirituality because it helps <laughs> all participants to avoid their true selves, which comes from an emotion of fear, which you've been talking about. Yeah. But while at the same time helping participants maintain the delusion that they are spiritually progressive, which comes from a distortion of the pure desire to be spiritual creatures. Yeah, so inside of our souls, we all have this pure inbuilt desire to be spiritual creatures. We do. But pseudo-spirituality says, oh, we can fake that. True spirituality says, no, you can't fake that. You've got to become more loving and it's got to actually happen. It's got to be real. That's what true spirituality does. Pseudo spirituality says, "No, nah, you can fake that. You can fake, you know, you can fake the gratification of the soul. You can, you can make out your soul's gratified even when it's not." <laughs> and and that's pseudo spirituality. Mm. Yep. Okay, we said pseudo spirituality is hurtful and loves only a few. So what so does true spirituality do? It's pleasurable. Mm. And loves all. Yeah. 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 So when you notice any form of spiritual development that seems to attack a certain group or seems to uh, be unloving towards a certain group of people, then you know that they're not, it's not yet developed enough to become true spirituality. It's not yet developed enough to become all-inclusive. It doesn't mean that it accepts error, though. Can you see the difference? So true spirituality does not accept error in the sense that it doesn't, it doesn't accept error without saying something. But it does allow error. Can you see the difference? But it doesn't attack error from the perspective of trying to destroy it. Because true, true spirituality doesn't try to destroy anything. Right? But it does expose error. It does say, no, that is error, and it stands up for truth. That's what it does. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, in pseudo-spirituality, we feel good through spirit attachment. Okay. So what would uh, 
true spirituality do with spirit attachment? Well, how do we feel good in true spirituality? <laughs> <laughs> so say it into the microphone, Joy. <laughs> um, we feel a lot better with our spirit <laughs> Right, attachment. so true spirituality feels much better. <laughs> and Joy, how do we feel good in true Without spiritual practice? Without spirit addictions. How do we feel good? What, what brings us? Or Alex, yeah. As we grow in love, yeah. as as we grow in love and um, and get rid of, and feel our feelings so that we get rid of the errors, we naturally feel good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. where the joy comes. Yeah. But but what so does Alex, it feel about spirit Alex, attachments? Yeah. So I just I just feel you feel free. Exactly. From, from it creates the a sense of freedom. Yeah. yeah. F- freedom. Freedom from external influence. In other words, you can be the only person on the planet in a truly spiritual state and be okay and happy with that. So you, you feel totally free from anybody's external influence changing you to become like they are again. Right? And that's the beauty. And spirits, all they are doing is just trying to externally influence us. So... This beautiful thing about the true spirituality is that it frees us from external influence. You don't have to listen to a single person anymore because you're already listening to God and so therefore you're already in harmony with every single person. Mm. Yeah? So you don't, you don't have to engage a process of hierarchy because you've already got the connection with the person who created you. Yeah? Um. I just thought you feel a sense of accomplishment because it's you that's doing it. It's not someone else influencing. So everything good that you create, you feel good because it's like, hey, that was me. It wasn't some <laughs> spirit or yeah. even some other person. Exactly. So you have a stronger sense that you are engaging your own desires and passions and that you have become more loving in that process without needing the assistance of others to do so. Yes. So while others may have assisted you, um, and that's fine for others to assist you to become more loving. In the end, you know you've made a change inside of yourself. So there is a sort of a sense of, uh, and pride's probably not the right word, uh, because, it, because in the English language, pride means all sorts of things. But there's this sense of self-satisfaction that you gain from knowing that this desire to love came from within you. And, and, and yes, yeah, so as a result, there'll be inner peace and, and, and a sense of, Contentment as a result, yes? A question, please, Asia. I think I've spent most of my life being overcloaked by one or another or many. Yeah. And how can you tell that? Because I always felt a sense of freedom. I always felt, gosh, I'm learning, I'm good. But if I'm learning with someone else, what's the difference? I mean, there really are just me. Well, um, my suggestion is uh, I've, I've, I've given a series of talks recently in, in uh, England, wasn't it? Yep. Where I did those talks about uh, spirit influence, there were positive spirits that influence and negative spirits that influence us. There were two talks that I gave to the group of people in England, and and one was talking about guides and guardians and how they can positively influence us and teach us, and they are great to gain the assistance of, whereas others are negatively influence us. Now, sometimes the negative influence feels positive because it it, it meets our addictions, and this is where we've got to be honest with ourselves. So we've got to see whether it's an addiction that's causing us to be happy. So it's a bit like the smoker who gets his next cigarette. He feels happy once he's got it and he feels very unhappy when he hasn't got it. And we've got to work out whether that's why we're satisfied because we're actually addicted or not. And that's where self-honesty comes in. This is where we need to look at ourselves really honestly and go, is this an addiction or is this an actual satisfaction of my soul really going on here? Which one is it? And that requires a lot of self-honesty. And I think in that discussion, I actually talked about the groups of spirits who influence us positively, benevolent spirits, and the groups of spirits that influence us negatively, and how we can tell the difference between those two sets of influences. And just at the end there, did you say that they really are you? Uh... Well, yeah, that, that, that was really my question is that you're there, like I was drinking for quite a while and quite heavily, mm-hmm. and my wife would say, you know, you change. And I'd go, no, I don't, it's me. <laughs> and I'm going through these emotional experiences now because I'm a drinker and creating problems in the marriage, yeah. Yeah. and I'm growing from it. Yeah. 
Now, is that me growing, the entity that's with me that's growing through my experience, or we're both growing? Both. Exactly. So yes. when you say that you can have this uh, joy of you learning or you expressing something, I'm questioning, no, you don't, it's us. And it's like a football team. We all got better because of the experience. <laughs> yep. Um, I, I agree that uh, because of the law of attraction and how it works, every single attraction that occurs, even our attractions with spirits, can have a very positive benefit to us, even if the spirits that are attaching to us are negative in their nature. Right? However, to have a positive ex benefit to us, it has to be a choice within ourselves for it to be a positive benefit. Because we could actually choose to follow their negative nature and become worse as well. We could actually choose to take the negative course of action and actually degrade our condition. So it really, like obviously from your perspective, what you've done is you've chosen to take a positive course of action and therefore you've improved from the experience even if the experience was with a negative spirit. Yeah, it's like a marriage. There are good days and bad days. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But what I'm saying is that your attitude was one of trying to grow, or of wanting positive growth. Well, it is now. It when is you, now. In the past it wasn't, was it? And so... Yeah. yeah I, I really feel think it was. I was right. growing because through drinking or smoking, whatever the item is, yep. you're, you're generating that bad experience that you can, that you can learn, learn from. from. Exactly. So that's a benefit having them. But you don't need to have the bad experience in order to learn. Oh, when you're stupid, you do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, I agree. I agree with that. But uh, God didn't create any stupid creatures, though. <laughs> no, See, we learnt it. Yeah, yeah. yeah we learnt exactly. to become stupid. But, but the reality is that we only need to have that kind of learning when we're already resistive to the more gentle form of learning. Yeah. Yep. And I agree with that. And when you do do that, then yes, any interaction you have, because God's created a loving existence and a loving world, any interaction you have, you can, if you choose for it to become a loving influence in your life, you can benefit from the interaction. Um, many do not, though. Many choose to, to have a, cause to be an unloving experience and they have very, very negative responses to the same stimuli as a result. So it really gets down to our personal sincerity of do we wish to change and become more loving. So at some point in your personal life, you had a personal sincerity to become more loving. And that caused you or dragged you through these sometimes negative experiences. Yeah. And, that, and that is certainly positive in the end. It was a positive result, I agree. Okay what's, uh, okay, what's the ones we've missed out there? Pseudo-spirituality requires payment for all services. And I so think what you've would uh, that. true spirituality do? Free. 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 Gives freely. And we've said here without monetary demand, but it's also without any sort of demand. Without isn't any it? demand, yeah. emotional or otherwise, yes. Mm. So it's a gift. And we keep using that term gift in most of our presentations because we need to learn how to give, right? And it's about giving with nothing, with no potential of anything coming back necessarily. Okay, and finally, I think you might have mentioned this one also, pseudo-spirituality promotes self and ownership of knowledge. And I think you actually talked about... Yeah, so um, in other words, it shares knowledge. And it, it even promotes God and God's truth, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. it serves. Yeah. Right? So, so in other words, if I know something that you don't know, true spirituality would go, I would love to share this with you if you're willing to hear it. A person who, um, who, who wants to own knowledge would go, I'll share this with you as long as you pay me for it. Or I'll share this with you as long as you give me something in return for it. Adulation. <laughs> you know, yeah. whether that's worship or adulation or honour or whatever that is. Whereas uh, a person who's truly spiritual will just share without expecting anything back at all. Yep. That's good. Okay, okay. and finally, uh, pseudo-spirituality uses the words without substance. <laughs> so true spirituality would walk the talk. Yes? And all of us know... 
what that means as a slogan. Some of us find that quite difficult to do, but uh, we all know what it means. So what we'd like to do after the break is we want to discuss more about the spirit-based influences and how true spirituality would help those influences. And we also would like to discuss about sexuality and how what kind of things would be involved with true spirituality when it comes to sexuality. So they are the two particular things we'd like to cover in the hour afterwards. If we can just have a short break, long enough to uh, grab a, go to the loo and maybe grab a drink of water or so, and then come back, that would be great. <laughs> 